Well, thank you so much to the Stanford Historical Society for inviting me to speak here today. As stated, I'm an anthropology PhD candidate here at Stanford, and I'm really excited to present to you on a project I've been working on the past couple of years in close collaboration with the uh, staff and collections at the Stanford University Archaeology Collections. This talk has a corresponding exhibition, uh, which I curated at the Stanford Archaeology Center, and it's open, I think, until the end of October. This presentation is going to be a deep dive into Leland Stanford Jr.'s life and his love of collecting. I'll examine the artifacts he acquired as a means to offer a more nuanced understanding into Leland Jr.'s penchant. While the Cent Cantor Center for Visual Arts has a great and extensive collection and exhibition on artifacts connected to the Stanford family and Leland Jr.'s life, this presentation is a no more narrow focus on a set of archaeological and ethnographic objects from the Stanford University Archaeology Collections. The archaeology collections have recently moved back to campus and are now more easily accessible allowing for objects that have been in storage for decades to be part of new research, teaching, and outreach agendas. The set of artifacts affiliated with Leland Jr. in the archaeology collections, when examined as a collective whole, provide a direct link to Leland Jr. himself in a way that memorial texts and histories, which have a tendency to aggrandize, do not. The objects we will talk about today will reveal not only a story about Leland's character, interests, and developing passions, that will also expose how memorialization and cultural trends of the late 19th and early 20th centuries have shaped the traditional ways we think about Leland Jr., his family, and the founding of the university. I want to start off with an illuminating quote written shortly after Leland Stanford Jr.'s passing. His visits to the British Museum, the Louvre, the Vatican, and the Berlin Museum fired his ambition. He, too, would create something he, too, would have a collection of old arms to show the progress of man's passion, of manufactured goods to show the progress of his civilization, of machinery to show that of his invention, and of fine arch to show his progress and taste. And gradually, what had been the pastime of an hour became the purpose of a life. He determined that when his collection had attained sufficient proportions to rank with other national museums, he would present it to the city of San Francisco. These words, written by Herbert C. Nash, Leland Stanford Jr.'s private tutor, paint a lucid picture of what was and what could have been. The deliberate usage of present, past, and future tenses creates an ambiguous tone that reflects the shock and disappointment connected to the sudden loss of Leland Jr., the only son of California governor and railroad tycoon Leland Stanford Sr. and heiress Jane Lathrop Stanford. At 15 years old and 10 months, Leland Jr. lost his life to typhoid fever. But in his short lifespan, according to his family, friends, and acquaintances, he managed to accomplish a lot, especially in the realm of collecting. Significant scholarly works consider the institutional histories and the profound impact of the Leland St Stanford Junior Museum and University on American higher education. However, little research has specifically and exclusively focused on Leland's collecting tendencies and the actual objects he acquired. How much of his affinity for gathering artifacts was aggrandized in memorialization strategies that meant to serve an institutionalizing purpose? Did he really have a promising career in philanthropy and museum building, as the quote I just read to you suggests? The artifacts we will take a look at today are part of the recently relocated and revived Stanford University archaeology collections. The objects within the archaeology collections are more anthropological rather than art historical and thus transi transitioned out of the University Museum in the 1940s and became affiliated with and under the purview of the anthropology department. Because of this split, Leland Jr.'s acquisitions, which formed the foundational collections of the Leland Stanford Jr. Museum, got divided as the more archaeological and ethnographic objects came under the anthropology department and eventually the Stanford University archaeology collections. Considering the popular foundational history that surrounds Leland Jr.'s life and budding curatorial habits, it's easy to assume that finding a complete list of objects concretely attributed to Leland Jr.'s collecting would be a straightforward task. Yet, because of the various restructurings the university's archaeological and anthropological collections have faced, and the multiple and sometimes incomplete types of collection records used over the century, the task of finding a comprehensive list of Leland's collections has been challenging. A lack of a complex, cross-institutional list has created gaps in our knowledge about Leland Jr. and has sometimes led to assumptions that occasionally transform into misinformation. Today, I'll offer a critical analysis of the objects Leland collected to reveal not only what they say about Leland's tastes and characteristics, 
though also what they say about the way we construct and accept institutional histories in memorializations. In order to better understand these objects and what they divulge about Leland's life, I'll break this presentation down into a few sections. First, I'll outline how the idea of this project came about and what research methodologies I used because this really informed the questions and the assumptions that emerged from this research. Second, I'll give a kind of brief uh, historical analysis of Leland's life. And finally, we'll take a look at objects analysis and see how they can reconceptualize histories and the future use of the potential of Leland's collections. My fascination with Leland's curatorial proclivities emerged from a personal research interest of mine that of the history of American universities. As a scholar of cultural heritage, I am curious as to how objects and places tie into issues of identity, politics, and past mastering. Prior to Stanford, my four years as a Cornell University tour guide, coupled with research and work I've done with the Cornell Classical Cast Collection, the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Anthropology, and the Cornell Herbert F. Johnson Museum of Art, have made me curious as to how American universities use their foundational histories and collections to fashion their institutional identities. The beginnings of this Leland Jr. project started in the fall of 2014 when a colleague, Sam Holly Klein, and I, for our graduate seminar in anthropological methods, conducted a Stanford-based ethnography. With combined interests in heritage and identity making, we became curious as to how Stanford projected itself to visitors and potential students, and decided to conduct an anthropological study on Stanford tour guides. <laughs> After following several tours, and interviewing guides, we started to analyze commonly occurring themes and trends. Of the 10 tours we followed, each guide mentioned the founding story of the university within at least the first 15 minutes of their tours. While the details each guide provided were often quite different, the guides each made clear that it was Jane and Leland Stanford Sr.'s deep <coughs> love for their son that promulgated the creation of not only a university, but also a museum. While typically the guides focus more on Leland's parents' grief rather than Leland Jr.'s burgeoning life, I was struck by one guide's description of Leland Stanford Jr. She stated that he had, quote, the best childhood anyone could ask for, end quote, and detailed how he loved to travel and collect artifacts as he aspired to be a museum curator when he grew up. It made me think how much of the stories we hear about Stanford's founding are embellished and what happens when we start to unpack these traditional histories. Often, the histories of American universities get condensed and modified into given fact that university students rarely question. Frequently, these histories become legends that are peppered with fantastical and sometimes inaccurate stories and myths. <laughs> Around the time Sam and I conducted our ethnographic study of Stanford tour guides, I began to spend time researching in the Stanford University archaeology collections. In 2013 and 2014, the collections moved back from their temporary storage facility in Redwood City to a permanent set of rooms in Margaret Jacks Hall, right off Memorial Quad. Dr. Christina Hodge, the academic curator and collections manager of the Stanford University Archaeology Collections, suggested I take up a project concerning Leland Jr.'s collections as the university's 125th anniversary was fast approaching. With her guidance and assistance, I began to comb through the catalog records to assemble a list of all the artifacts attributed to Leland Jr.'s collecting. Perhaps, she said, they, they could turn it into an exhibit one day. Part of the efforts to move the archaeology collections back on campus was to reinstate them in teaching, research, and outreach initiatives. This has required staff and student research to spend countless hours reorganizing, incorporating not only the materials in the collections, but also their subsequent records. Part of my efforts to locate objects associated with Leland Jr. aligned with these new organizational agendas. The archaeological and ethnographic objects that are currently in the Stanford University archaeology collections are part of a long and complex institutional history, tracing back to the founding of the university. The objects experienced several institutional splits and rehousings over the course of decades. The most significant of these upheavals were the creation of the Anthropology Department Museum in the mid-20th century and the legal transfer of collections from what is now the Cantor Museum to the Anthropology Department in 1994. Since 2000, the Archaeology Center has managed these materials. These changes led to an unusually complex set of cataloging records. So right now on the screen is what the cataloging records currently look like in the archaeology collections. Currently, the archaeology collection records, there are standardized types of information that define each object including an ID number, description, uh, date, 
collector, collection data, provenance, to just name a few. I created targeted searches within these categories to see what, if anything, I could find that may have been attributed to the collection of Leland. First, I started off by typing in different variations of Leland Stanford Jr.'s name into the collection category. And the reason you see so many iterations up here is because over 100 years, people typed in or wrote his name down differently. And the search terms are so specific that if you don't pick up on all of these different iterations, you're going to lose records. So I spent so many like, weeks trying to figure out different ways people wrote Leland Stanford Jr.'s name down. <laughs> so by typing in all of these iterations, I was able to find 13 objects alone that were attributed to the collector uh, portion within the collections management software. However, I needed to back this claim up with other categorical information. The most thorough information often came from the provenance section. So I did a collection-wide uh, term search with all of these different inter iterations into the provenance section. And I came up with a, a lot of different finds. Uh, many of the objects had a vague connection to Leland, uh, but some had more direct. So some popular phrases that appeared were purchased by Jane Stanford for the collection of the Leland Stanford Junior Museum, donated in 1890, or part of the original collections of the Leland Stanford Junior Museum. Or my favorite and most elusive may have been collected by Leland Stanford Jr. <laughs> These more convoluted descriptions made it difficult to tell if Leland Jr. had a direct connection to the acquisition of these objects in questions. And here you can see again that the, I did searches in this collector find and also in the provenance section. I immediately disregarded items that seemed to have not been collected by Leland Jr., like the ones donated in 1890, several years after his death. However, for more vaguely worded provenance histories like may have been collected by Leland Stanford Jr., I turned to the physical catalog cards for the objects. The catalog cards constitute an organizational system that started in the museum in the 1930s and later switched over to a digitized system in the 1970s that saw several iterations until its current form today. Basically, through the history of the archaeology and ethnographic collections and their gradual split from the university museum into a separate collection affiliated with the Department of Anthropology, objects experienced a wide array of renumbering and recategorizing. In summary, it was essential for me to go back and look at the old records to see if any information had been lost with the gradual, decades-long switch over to computer-based records. I flipped through every catalog card, and there were thousands. This is only one box of many. <laughs> and also scanned the 1970s computerized catalog book to see if there was any reference to Leland Stanford Jr. And you can see how this computerized book is much different from how information is organized on the catalog cards. The, the same information is essentially there, but uh, it's more easy to scan and read the catalog cards, whereas this page to the left is the first page in a thousand page book, and it tells you, you know, line one is the, the acquisition number and then the collector number. So if you didn't memorize the lines, you'd have to flip back to the first page. <laughs> so <laughs> it takes a lot of time. <laughs> Um, from this read-through, I was able to find a few relevant objects from both the catalog cards and this system called Celgem that weren't listen, listed in the present-day collections management software. After six months of meticulously combing through the records, I had compiled a list of 23 objects within the Stanford University archaeology collections that records explicitly stated were collected by Leland Stanford, Jr. The next phase of research was to look at the objects as a collective whole, to see what they could reveal about Leland. This required both primary source research and a literature review on historical studies pertaining to the life of the Stanfords and the creation of the university and museum. Carol Osborne's 1986 Museum Builders in the West provided one of the most thorough analyses of the establishment of the museum. Her extensive work with primary source materials, including letters and contemporary news articles, allowed her to undertake a deep dive into why and for whom the museum was originally created. In particular, her insight into Leland's proclivity toward artifact collection began to treat Leland's hobbies and endeavors as a set of critical actions that needed to be analyzed outside the purview tied solely to Stanford's foundational history and mythos. The English and American studies scholar Karen Sanchez Elper in her 2013 article entitled Children as Collectors of Cultural Heritage, Leland Stanford Jr. and His Museum, 
probes much deeper into Leland Jr.'s history of collecting and is one of the only scholars who treats Leland Jr. as a focused subject of inquiry. Yet both Osborne and Sanchez Elper come to similar conclusions that entwine Leland Jr.'s life with those of his parents. While Osborne suggests that Jane Stanford aggrandized Leland's collecting tendencies as a means to legitimize her work of putting together and essentially leading the museum, Sanchez Elper concludes that Leland's childhood collection not only educated him, but instructed his parents as well. While I agree with Osborne and Sanchez Elper that it is impossible to talk about Leland without factoring in his parents, as he was extremely close to them, perhaps so more so than children of the time, I wanted to know if it was possible to surmise things about Leland that indicate autonomy and burgeoning promise as portrayed in Stanford's foundational histories. Both Osborne and Sanchez Elper mentioned some of the various objects Leland collected in his lifetime, but I was curious to see how a group of objects in the archaeology collections could reveal clues or patterns into Leland's rationality. Could Leland really have affected the future art training of the American people as the curator of the Met described him in a letter shortly after his death? The first line of inquiry was to figure out when the objects had been collected. For reading primary source accounts of Leland Jr.'s life, whether from the letters he wrote or the contemporary accounts of his childhood and collection posthumously written by his private tutor, Herbert C. Nash, it became clear that it would be most prudent to divide Leland's short life into three periods, early childhood pre-European trip, first European trip, and second European trip. This division allowed me to chronologically analyze in order in which Leland collected his objects as a means to see if there was any sort of pattern to his uh, acquisitions. And so here you see just a really broad general timeline. He was born in 1868, uh, and he had his first trip to Europe in the spring of 1880, returned in the winter of 1882, got to California, spent the spring and summer before going back to New York again, and then the family went again to Europe in 1883 and sadly he died in Italy in the spring of 1884. <clears throat> Leland spent his first years of life primarily in his Knob Hill home in San Francisco and on the Stanford property in Vena and Palo Alto. All of these properties led to Leland's instructional teachings. Leland Stanford Sr. purchased the Vena Ranch as a means for his son to spend a significant portion of his childhood outside in nature. The mansion in San Francisco also created an educational environment for Leland Jr. The public rooms of the Stanford's Knob Hill Mansion were designed in accordance to different national and temporal themes. India for the reception room, Pompeii for the drawing room, Turkey for the dining room, Italy for the family parlor, and Flanders for the billiard room. <laughs> Certainly, as Leland ran through the house, playing, observing the day-to-day, -day, and joining the company that would visit his parents, he would have been exposed to a rich and eclectic visualization of the world. Even if he wasn't aware of the particular histories or cultural peculiarities of every overtly decorated national room, he at least would have been aware that they evoked an otherly space full of a collection of foreign items and exotic aesthetics. To continue on this idea that Leland was being constantly intellectually stimulated, Nash notes how Leland Jr. was treated as an intellectual equal with his parents. He writes, quote, they made him their constant companion and strove to increase his self-respect by putting him on equality with themselves, end quote. Leland was allowed to join in on conversations and interacted with many of the Stanford's distinguished visitors, including bishops, justices of the Supreme Court, and US state senators. If he was privy to and included in on adult conversations, Leland Jr. must have also been up to speed with some of his father's business and philanthropic dealings. In 1882, Leland Stanford Sr. bought with fellow railroad tycoon Charles Crocker the Ward Collection of Geology, Natural History, and Mineralogy, which they bequeathed to the California Academy of Sciences. Acquiring and gifting museum collections, then, was something that was already commonplace within the Stanford family long before the creation of the university and museum. No doubt some of Leland Jr.'s affinity for collecting would have been swayed by his father's acquisitive tendencies and the contemporary desire of American elites at the time to collect and bequeath objects meant to educate the American public. In fact, Nash notes that Leland Jr. quote, showed signs of taste which characterized him his more advanced years, end quote through the orderly layout of his playroom with his toy steam engine, telegraphic apparatus, and carpenter bench, 
uh, meticulously laid out and juxtaposed against walls covered in drawings of machinery, railroads, and ships. It's interesting to note how Nash, throughout his writings on Leland's life and his collections, is insistent on suggesting that Leland grew up much quicker than other children of the time and reached an uncommon level of adulthood and independence. This would have echoed and paralleled ideas of American exceptionalism and the glorification of the self-made man that lingered in popular conceptions. But to what extent did Nash embellish Leland's growth in individualism? Starting in the mid-19th century with the rise of immigration, industrialization, and urbanization, contemporary uh, conceptualizations of children began to shift. Instead of being seen as labor that could contribute to family work, children began to be viewed more as a vulnerable class in need of protection from the growing dangers in life. Children were considered innately good beings that would, that would eventually grow to be the future of society and that constantly needed to be watched over and safeguarded. To a certain extent, Leland Jr. was doted on by his parents, who had him at the late age, it was 18 years after marriage. Um, but Nash makes clear that Leland Jr., unlike other children of the time, was able to question his surroundings and feel as an equal to his uh, parents, rather than an inferior in need of protecting. This environment, coupled with the surroundings he grew up in, suggests that Leland had access to unique resources and conditions that were not necessarily common to other children of the time, even elite children. I bring all of this up because Leland had all these collective experiences before his trips to Europe. They most certainly swayed the way he approached his travels and also affected his already burgeoning hobby of collecting and arranging small toys and mechanical objects and drawings in his room in Nob Hill. The Stanfords left for their first European trip in the spring of 1880 and traveled up until the early uh, spring of, eight, of winter of 1882 to 10 different countries, including Ireland, Scotland, France, Holland, and Germany. While big trips to Europe were a common endeavor for the education of upper-class teenage boys, it was rare for families to let an 11-year-old travel, let alone to accompany him on his journey. This trip to Europe was Leland's initial overt introduction to antiquity. In the spring of 1881, the Stanfords visited Italy, where the Roman Colosseum was Leland Jr.'s first introduction to the monuments of ancient history, as Nat Nash notes. Leland, in his letter to his father, recounts the monument as a fine old ruin. <laughs> but it was in Pompeii where one of the most iconic moments in little Leland's collecting history occurred. In a letter written to his father in March 19, 1881, uh, about his fascination with Pompeii, Leland recalls how the guide at Pompeii, quote, allowed me to take a piece of fresco that had fallen from the wall on the floor, end quote. Yet Nash recalls the moment differently, claiming that Jane Stanford was the one to put the mosaic in his hand, saying to Leland Jr., let this be the nucleus of your museum. <laughs> the disparity between Leland's description and that of Nash's is both striking and telling. Here is a clear example of how Leland's love for antiquities collecting was aggrandized after his death, a moment that seemed exciting but perhaps trivial to Leland was posthumously refashioned as a pivotal moment in his life by his family and mentors. Leland seemed to collect an array of miscellaneous objects on his trip to, as Nash says, recall the circumstances of his stay. At the same time, Leland was also cultivating his tastes. Nash goes into great detail about how Leland enjoyed passing judgments and bold opinions on statues and paintings he encountered in Europe, like his dislike for Michelangelo's Moses, but his fascination with the Farnese bull, and I just love this quote. You can just tell he's a budding connoisseur. <laughs> this display of critique and taste suggests that Leland was deliberately looking at objects from a perspective perhaps akin to his father and mother's respective admiration for collecting and decorating. If he was aware that his father had bought museum collections and bequeathed them to San Francisco, and was conscious of his mother's aesthetic style in the elaborately decorated rooms of the Knob Hill Mansion, Maybe Leland Jr. wanted to also take on a methodical, critical eye that would one day transform into a museum Nash claimed Leland wanted to make for the gratification and education of the people of San Francisco. Yet all of this talk of taste in Nash's first-hand accounts does not exactly align with the objects Leland collected. 
Upon his return to San Francisco, Jane urged Leland to arrange his purchases in the attic of the Knob Hill mansion. In 1882, before a second trip to Europe, Leland Jr. inaugurated his International Museum. From photographs of this initial attic collection, and this is just three different angles from, from this International Museum, it appears that Leland arranged his artifacts according to personal taste rather than in conventional categories of period, place, medium, or culture. While the photographs were taken after Leland's death, it is likely, as stated in Nash's accounts, that Jane preserved the arrangement of Leland's collections with some modifications. One room, which is this room, the space Leland dubbed his International Museum was left mostly untouched and displayed Leland's carefully arranged artifacts from his childhood and his first trip abroad. A second room, which Jane organized right after her return from Europe, featured all the artifacts Leland collected while on his second trip abroad. These rooms together were named the Leland Stanford Junior Museum in 1884 and had an accompanying written guide to their respective artifacts. While I couldn't locate Jane's original guide, I was able to find these original captions for some of the items in, in these rooms written in Jane's handwriting. Jane was adamant about keeping the museum locked and only open for family and special visitors when it was in Knob Hill. But as time passed, the collections moved to the museum on Stanford University's campus, where their display mimicked the setup in Knob Hill. So with background knowledge of my research process and the environment Leland encountered in his childhood, I want to spend the rest of this presentation focusing on the objects Leland collected. Let's first take a look at the artifacts featured in this photograph that we've already seen um, of Leland's International Museum, as they are peculiar and illuminating of Leland's earliest collecting agendas. The first object I want to speak about constitutes a sledge runner made of bone. Little is known about the provenience or provenance of this object. With no contextual clues, it's difficult to trace the exact origins of this object, but it most likely came from the Northwest North America. The only piece of provenance information available on the catalog cards claims that it was collected by Leland Jr. before 1882 and was part of the founding collections of the Leland Stanford Jr. Museum, which opened to the public in the fall of 1893. The catalog information was compiled and entered by Harry Claude Peterson, the museum's director from 1900 to 1917. We can back up the claim that it was part of the initial museum as the sledge runner features in this picture of Leland's attic collection in the Stanford's Knob Hill residence. Jane Stanford most likely relayed the information to Peterson that it was collected before 1882 as she took an active and at times overbearing role over the museum's acquisitions and collections up until her death in 1905. If the sledge runner was collected before 1882, then it most likely was collected by Leland on or before his first trip to Europe. There are a few possible sources from which he may have acquired the sledge runner. First, Leland may have collected this from an antiquities dealer based in Europe or the United States. We know that Leland was already visiting antiquities dealers on his first trip to Europe from his letters and was probably doing so even before he left California. At the time of its collection, polar exploration and the lives of indigenous Arctic peoples captivated American anthropologists and the public. While the major Arctic explorations happened a few years after the collection of this runner, curiosity about this part of the world was growing exponentially. Perhaps the dealer, aware of this growing fervor, especially amongst American audiences, presented this item to Leland. This is especially plausible if the dealer was located in California, as they would have had greater access to ethnographic objects from northwestern North America. It's also quite possible that one of the Stanford's many distinguished friends and acquaintances presented this item to Leland. There are two other sledge runners in the Stanford University archaeology collections, suggesting that Leland acquired these at the same time. Beyond understanding the object's provenance, let's look at why Leland would acquire this object. Being the son of a railroad magnate, Leland had an early fascination with mechanics. This sledge runner would have most likely piqued his interest as an example of an item that represented motion and travel in a way quite divergent from the engine-powered trains he had grown up around. Runners like this one were usually made from large animal bones and tied in pairs to sledges with leather tethers. Sledges carried supplies, animals, and humans across snow-covered landscapes. 
sledge runners like this one were covered with a mixture of moss, water, and clay in order to create an icy sheath that would break a trail in the snow, making compact tracks that became semi-permanent features in the landscape and used as a wayfinding aids for other sledges. Often, sledges were pulled by dogs, but smaller ones were dragged by humans. While Leland may not have been entirely aware of the details on how the sledge runners operated, it is clear that these objects functioned as some sort of tool in the aid of movement. Leland was no stranger to mechanics and displayed many toy engines in his playroom, uh, enjoyed afternoons uh, playing on his to toy railroad tracks, and spent entire days at the mechanical exhibitions at the Agricultural Hall in London. The runner, therefore, would have fit in perfectly with his already existent interests. This bird-shaped vessel may have had a similar acquisition story to that of the sledge runner. Not much is known about the provenience of this object. It is a ceramic type known as the San Francisco red earthenware that was a diagnostic <coughs> mugion type from the southwest United States, dating anywhere between 100 and 1400 CE. Like the runner, this object's provenance is listed as having been collected by Leland Jr. before 1882 and part of the museum's founding collections. This vessel is prominently displayed in the photographs of the Knob Hill collection we were looking at before. Perhaps this object was collected from a dealer on his first European trip, or it could have been gifted to Leland, like the sledge, at an even earlier age as he grew up in California. The word collected in the provenance records gives Leland active agency, but remains vague. It's possible that visitors to the Knob Hill residence before or after Stanford's tr first trip to Europe heard of Leland's fascination with nature, mechanics, and art and gifted it to him. In fact, American intellectuals in the 19th century had a fascination with artifacts that came out of American soil. It wasn't until around the 1880s that American archaeological archeolo interests shifted from excavations in the New World to exploration of the Old World. The vessel, if collected before 1882, as stated in the catalog records, is reminiscent of the last epochs of an archaeological trend. It's unclear if Leland was tuned into these shifts in contemporary taste. The placement of the vessel shows that Leland wasn't necessarily privy, like I said before, to the nuances and forefronts of archaeological fashions, which organized objects in typological arrangements based on culture and date and medium. The vessel was placed below South Pacific mats, clubs, bows, spears, and arrows, and next to an articles from Alaska, like the sledge runner. Obviously, these objects weren't arranged chronologically, regionally, or by medium, but they seem to reflect Leland's personal aesthetics. Leland no doubt found the vessel's shape and color intriguing and thus worthy of display amongst his other cherished artifacts. Leland inaugurated these objects and many others in his newly minted International Museum on May 2nd, 1882 in the attic of Knob Hill, right before his second trip to Europe. Leland approached the second trip with a more organized and determined outlook in terms of his collecting strategies. Before their departure in late May, Leland visited the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City, which set the tone for his trip. At the Met, he met the director, Luigi Palma di Cesnola, who showed Leland various antiquities, including a small colored glass vase of three or four inches. Leland's budding fervor for the Met's collections, Nash notes, compelled Cesnola to write a letter of introduction on behalf of Leland Jr. in order to grant him access to Europe's finest collections. While Nash expounds on Leland's enthusiasm as the impetus for this letter, Carol Osborne notes that Leland Sr. had already made a gift of $1,000 to the Met, a donation that certainly earned the notice of the director. <laughs> An excerpt of Cesnola's letter to the director of the South Kensington Museum in England from September 22, 1883 reads, I know very well that I need only say that he is a friend of mine to secure for him a kind, of, a kind reception and all the facilities he may wish in order to visit and intelligently inspect the wonderful treasures of your museum. The Metropolitan Museum, founded in 1870, 13 years before the date of Cesnola's letter, constituted one of the first encyclopedic museums in America, displaying artifacts from a wide range of cultures and millennia. Cesnola's letter gave Leland the appropriate backing for him to enter Europe's great encyclopedic and universal mu museums, many of which had founded 100 years prior and had much more renowned reputations. 
As stated previously, American scholar, scholars started taking an increased interest in old world rather than new world artifacts in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Excavations on the North American continent began to slow as digs weren't producing sought after monumental architecture and ancient writing, which constituted the large majority of finds from sites abroad. American museums and universities began to more heavily focus on collecting antiquities from Egypt, the Near East, and the Mediterranean as a means to contend with trends in Europe and to continue filling big encyclopedic museums meant to showcase American taste, class, and nationhood. While it's unclear if Leland Jr. was conscious of contemporary archaeological trends before and during his first European trip, his second European trip confirmed his awareness. In a letter written by Leland on Christmas Day from Vienna in 1883, he exclaims to his friend, I expect to get a good many things from my museum. I am now collecting Egyptian, Greek, and Roman antiquities. His reference to the present moment clearly states that he is following a new personal agenda. In the summer of 1883, when the Stanfords arrived in Paris, Leland spent countless days in the Louvre, where, according to Nash, Leland looked at the work of contemporary Egyptologists and copied the hieroglyphics, sarcophagi, and scarabai with the help of budding scholar George Darcy, only a few years older than him. Nash notes that it actually was the Rosetta Stone, which Leland saw earlier in the British Museum, that piqued Leland's turn to the antiquities of the old world, stating, quote, he once said that the Rosetta Stone taught him his ancient history, for it first awakened his curiosity, end quote. This bold statement, where Leland claims that the Rosetta Stone symbolized a turning point in his collecting habits, makes every acquisition activity before seem to be a less directed hobby rather than a deliberate habit. It's almost as if Leland, in attributing his newly directed passion for collecting to a specific object, considered himself on par with famous archaeologists at the time who often established their careers with the discovery of pivotal artifacts or sites. Leland, then, was staking a claim in the field of archaeology and collecting. With his second trip to Europe in mind, let's take a look at two objects he acquired while abroad. They both reflect his emergent affinity for Egyptian antiquities. The first object is a votive figure of the god Osiris made of bronze. Osiris is an Egyptian figure connected to fecundity and a guardian of the balances and cycles of nature. He was also the ruler of the underworld and thus the protector of the deceased, ensuring life after death. The cult of Osiris emerged during the Old Kingdom around 2700 BC to 2055 BC and became a common feature of Egyptian funerary culture by the later period, which is dated to around 664 to 323 BC. Small votive figures like this one were often bought and left at temples where they functioned as offerings and dedications. Because Leland spent a substantial amount of time at the Louvre copying hieroglyphics and Egyptian symbols, Nash claims that Leland was able to distinguish the signs of dynasties, pharaohs, and a number of gods. No doubt when Leland purchased this object, he must have delighted in the fact that despite the heavy rusting, he could recognize the god Osiris from the figure's canonical wrap shroud and the crook and flail of kingship in his crossed arms. This object was most likely acquired from the dealer Jean Henry Hoffman, who sold a substantial number of antiquities to the Louvre. In Nash's In Memoriam, he recounts how Leland bought from Hoffman a bronze of the god Osiris, as well as cats of various sizes, a figure of Apis, the sacred bull, hawks, serpents, two ibises, a crocodile, and several figures of the god Horus, Osiris, and Anubis. Leland wasn't just buying one-off items that piqued his interest, as he did in his first trip, but rather now he was accumulating items for a greater purpose, that of adding to his collections. The Osiris figure was purchased within a cache of other objects that were meant to reflect Leland's taste and understandings of large archaeological and scholarly trends of the time. Unlike the bird-shaped vessel or the sledge runner, which were almost collected in a haphazard, directionalist manner that merely catered toward Leland's personal aesthetics, happenstance opportunities, or childhood interests, his bulk purchases began to reveal more deliberate undertakings. In fact, in a letter written to his father from Paris on September 12, 1883, Leland states, I have been buying several things for my museum, and I think that I shall have to enlarge it when I get home. The second object constitutes a bronze pin from the 26th dynasty dated from 685 to around 525 BCE, 
Leland probably acquired this pin around the same time as the Osiris figurine. Egyptian pins like this would secure fabrics draped around the body in various ways. While the pin does not depict more exciting symbols like gods or hieroglyphics, Leland may have found this artifact as a plain yet intriguing example of an everyday personal item from ancient Egypt. Additionally, the small and portable quality of both the Osiris figurine and the pin made these objects easily transferable. The Stanfords were on a regimented travel schedule that allowed them to visit many destinations. While it's true that larger objects like vases, jars, sculptures, and other heavy items were shipped back to San Francisco, Leland, his parents, and Nash may have personally carried items from stop to stop. In fact, Leland bemoans in a letter addressed to her friend in February 1884 how Nash lost a valise containing an assortment of objects stating, now anything that can't be found happened to be in that. It appears that Leland was already keeping track of the items he was collecting organizing and categorizing them in a systematic way that allowed him to recall what was missing. This makes a departure from his earlier acquisitions as he only stated, started categorizing items after his return from his first trip to Europe. Unfortunately, before the Stanford's second European trip finished, Leland contracted typhoid fever and passed away in Italy. Struck with grief, Leland Senior and Jane Stanford almost immediately began concocting plans to memorialize Leland Originally, the Stanfords considered constructing three different monuments, including a university in Palo Alto, a museum in San Francisco, combined with a large hall for free public lectures, and thirdly, a technical school. After some deliberation and consultation with distinguished friends and acquaintances, the Stanfords decided on creating a university and museum located both in Palo Alto. The Leland Stanford Junior Museum, at the time of its opening, was the largest privately owned museum in the world. Its connections to university was reflective of an emerging trend in higher education, both abroad and in the United States. Both museums and universities were considered sites of knowledge production. However, museums were seen as making that knowledge more accessible to both a general and specialized audience. This dual purpose, especially when closely affiliated with the university, won global praise for the American museum model. While the museum on campus wasn't inaugurated until 1891 and officially opened its doors in the fall of 1893, Jane and Leland Stanford Sr. both started to immediately expand their son's collection shortly after his death. Jane opened the Leland Stanford Jr. Museum in their Knob Hill residence right after their return from Europe in 1884, while Leland Sr. opened negotiations with the Metropolitan Museum to acquire 5,000 duplicates of the director Cessnola's collection of Cypriot antiquities. In fact, Jane became so enthralled with collecting that she acquired around 15,000 objects before the museum's official opening. She continued her fervor for expanding her late son's collections by undertaking all museum acquisitions until her death in 1905. The Stanford Museum was an outlet for her grief and a way to memorialize her son. It's at the moment of Leland's death and that his hobby and habit became entwined with that of Jane's and her desire to properly memorialize her son. I want to draw attention to a particular set of objects that point to the transformative effect memorialization strategies had on the transfer of information in the collection records. Let's return back to this photo of the Knob Hill collections. It displays the room that contained the objects Leland collected, arranged and organized before 1882. Allegedly, according to Nash, this room was kept as is, freezing Leland's affinity for collecting in its supposed original form. Yet, it appears that this room contains objects not collected by Leland himself. Underneath the table, you'll see a set of mortars and pestles. These mortars and pestles were found on the Stanford's farms and ranches. The Stanford's Palo Alto land holdings were located within Ohlone uh, tribal homelands. Campus archaeology has confirmed a high density of village sites near the Stanford's property in Palo Alto. Mortars and pestles, like these ones here, were often used to process acorns and mussels, reflecting early inhabitants' in intensive use of diverse local resources. In the catalog cards, on the storage boxes for these items, and on the labels located directly on the objects themselves, several of these mortars and pestles have been recorded as found by Leland in 1883, a year Leland Jr. never set foot in California. He died before returning. This date most likely comes from Jane's own cataloging of the objects in the museum, as it's well known that she kept an informational sheet about the artifacts on display. 
The date after Leland's death reflects how attempts to honor Leland's memory at times conflated with what actually transpired. In this case, how the mortars and pestles were actually collected. Nash notes that in the spring and summer of 1882, so the interim between the Stanford's two trips to Europe, Leland spent the summer in California, partly in outdoor country life and partly in the classification and arrangement of his collections. In particular, the Stanford's ranch in Vena was purchased with Leland in mind, as Leland Sr. wanted his son to lead an active life where agricultural pursuits would help Leland Jr. identify with local people, provide a healthful occupation, and develop his senses and physical powers. In fact, Leland loved country life so much that he spent his days in the fields amongst the laborers, where Nash noted that all the farmhands were his friends. Perhaps the date on the catalog cards was transmitted wrong, and it was meant to be written as 1882. But it's more likely that it was the farmhands on the Stanford's ranches who discovered the mortars and pestles. Aware of Leland's enthusiasm for archaeological inquiry, or alternatively instructed by Leland's parents to hand these items over to Leland's museum, the farm laborers seem to have been more likely the ones who discovered these items when working on Stanford's extensive land holdings. If they were discovered in 1883, Leland didn't even get a chance to see them. Jane most likely arranged these objects in the Knob Hill Museum, memorializing Leland Jr. in the collection records, rather than attributing them to the farm staff. Painting a picture of Leland as not only an educated individual who collected artifacts, but one that actively looked for and discovered objects would solidify his image as an eager and promising art connoisseur, emphasizing that his death was, at, as the Met director claimed, a great loss to the art education of the American people. Let's move on to a final set of objects. Before his death, Leland Jr. stated that he wished to collect Chinese, Japanese, and American mound builder artifacts. Jane honored this wish in several ways. She purchased the William McAdams collection from Midwestern United States mound sites from the New Orleans Exposition of 1884 to 1885, shortly after Leland Jr.'s death. She also acquired 289 Japanese objects in 1888 from a former US minister to Japan. The items shown here are from Williams McAdams' collection, most likely from the Hopewell and Mississippian archaeological cultures. They constitute a grouped axe head, mortar, pestle, and the plaster repli replica of a bird-shaped smoking pipe. Note how they all have continuity with the objects Leland Jr. had collected earlier in his life. The red color and symbolism of the smoking pipe matched the bird theme of the vessel collected before 1882. The stone objects, which, while different in size and function, match the mortars and pestles found by the Stanford farm laborers. The aesthetic Jane created through her additional collections both mimicked and diverged from Leland Jr.'s original collections. The set of objects we discussed today provide a more nuanced understanding of Leland's interest in collecting an antiquity. Beyond letters and personal accounts of Leland Jr., artifacts provided another direct link with the young Stanford and allow us to explore a fuller image of Leland's emerging collecting interests. Letters and books written about Leland after his passing seem to champion his curatorial tendencies, bemoaning the loss of such great talent. The objects Leland collected seem to corroborate these exceptional claims. Yes, some of these posthumous letters and writings sometimes aggrandized Leland's life, exasperated doubly by his parents' push to memorialize their son in a university museum. But it's important to note once again, that Leland had access to opportunities and environments not available to the average Californian child of the late 19th century. He spent a great deal of time with his family's distinguished visitors, speaking to his parents about a wide range of topics, passing long hours observing the latest mechanical inventions, and exploring the outdoors. Two trips to Europe when most upper class families could only afford one certainly broadened his mind and penchant for collecting in a way that a quiet, immobile childhood in California wouldn't have. Plus, Leland's very attentive parents made sure Leland had access to all the materials and objects he wanted. His father even gave him around $800 in the latter half of his second trip abroad to spend on his collecting habits. And remember, it's 1883, 84, so that's a lot of money. With Leland's passing, the objects he collected became a physical reminder and a connection to a boy who lost his life too early. While memorialization strategies and complex institutional histories and recording methods have shaped the way these artifacts have been traditionally talked about and imagined, 
Researching these objects as a collective whole can help us piece together an image of a young boy who was eager, excited, and determined to create a remarkable object legacy. And just as Jane assured that Leland's collection would have an impact on educating the future, the Stanford University libraries have initiated a new 3D scanning project that will ensure the longevity and accessibility of Leland Jr.'s collections. Stanford University Libraries has been interested in multimedia digitization. Besides facilitating 2D image scanning of hard materials, many of the photos you've seen in this presentation have come from that digitization process. Stanford University Libraries has recently undertaken an initiative to document and preserve some of the university's 3D collections. Stanford houses a plethora of art and archaeological and ethnographic artifacts. By 3D scanning and in future 3D printing these objects, these items have a chance to reach a wider audience and be preserved in a digital format for future generations. The Stanford University Archaeology Collections partnered with the libraries for the pilot study of 3D scanning objects. The study happened to coincide with the university's 125th anniversary, and thus Leland Jr.'s exhibit was chosen as a pilot. The expert library staff diligently created the 3D models and imaging based on the actual physical items. Claudia Engel, an affiliate of the Center for Interdisciplinary Di Digital Research and a lecturer in the Department of Anthropology, assembled the virtual exhibit, combining the exhibition text and the 3D scanned images onto an online platform. If you visit the Stanford University Library's website, you can have a chance to look at these objects and move them around in a way you can't with a physical exhibit. So I'll kind of show you an example of this. You can go on the website, and every object you've seen and more um, you can move around like this. And it's really cool because it does, there are a ton of photos compiled from the actual objects themselves. <coughs> With these new 3D scanning methods available, Stanford University will be able to document and create open access to objects on a worldwide scale. Leland's wish to educate the people of San Francisco now has the chance to take an even larger step further by reaching audiences around the globe. Before finishing, I want to acknowledge the departments and people whose close collaboration was instrumental in the completion of this project and exhibition. First, thank you to the Stanford University Archaeology Collections and their great access for students. I want to especially thank Dr. Christina Hodge, the academic curator and collections manager, and Lisa Rowan, the collections assistant, both of whom spent many, many hours working directly with me, guiding my research, and helping set up my exhibit. Thank you to the Stanford University Libraries, especially the Digital Services and Production Group, for creating the 3D scanned images. Thank you to the Stanford University Special Collections and the University Archives for their great access to archival materials and photographs. And thank you to the Stanford Archaeology Center for being instrumental in transforming the archaeology collections and for being central to my studies and to the exhibition. And finally, thank you again to the Stanford Historical Society for inviting me to speak here today. So thank you. We have time for questions or comments, so uh, I know there's mics that they can pass around if you have any questions for me. I can turn off. Oh, no, I don't remember which light. This one? Okay. Any questions? Yeah. I just wonder if you didn't know where the I didn't know that was his middle name. Um, I'm not quite sure where it came from, but there's this great anecdote. So uh, before 1882, his parents would call him Leland uh, DeWitt Stanford Jr., and his father doesn't have a middle name. And he kind of got upset that his name wasn't exactly like his father's and asked his, uh, apparently there was a lawyer visiting the house one day, and Leland wanted to legally remove DeWitt from his name. I don't know if it actually happened, but Nash recounts the story that he wanted his name to be exactly like his father. So from then on, people just started calling him Leland Jr., like they called him Leland Sr., but I don't know where DeWitt comes from. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Yes. You mentioned that, um, that Leland's museum in his home was organized uh, uh, not according to categories or categorization. Mm -hmm. And is there, do you have evidence that 
other collections in this country were organized that way at that time? Yeah, so like the Met Museum was organized by uh, archaeological culture and time period and other university museums at the time were. It started a while back in the early 1800s with uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum in Cambridge and Oxford uh, organized, started organizing objects by typology uh, and you see that happen in America too. Just basically a couple of curiosity questions. Mm -hmm. uh, is anything salvaged from the mansion after the 1906 fire? Uh, I believe so. I know Dr. Christina Hodge, who works at the collections, is here, and she knows more information on that. But I think there's even um, an exhibition at the Archaeology Center now that focuses on some of these artifacts. Maybe, is that correct, Christina? Don't they have? Yeah, that's correct. Right. The other question is, uh, any materials ever found at uh, Stanford's other farms, or did he look, for example, the Fremont or the farms in the valley? I'm, I'm not quite sure about that. At least the materials we have in the Stanford archaeology collections, the, the mortars and the pestles came from the Vena and the Palo Alto holdings. The Cantor might have materials from those places. Is the South Kensington Museum in London today's Victoria and Albert Museum? I believe it, it, it yes. is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there was some reference to Mississippian collections that the mother did after he died. Is, is that fairly extensive that she gathered? Because there's a lot of controversy about uh, this continent's uh, archaeological finds and how they've been treated by the Smithsonian and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So Just which, curious. which collections? I didn't hear you. Archaeology uh, collections from this continent. Oh, OK. It, could you repeat that again, if, there's, if we know more about that, what she collected? I know she went to expositions and collected uh, caches of objects that they were kind of selling off. We don't know the exact provenance, how they, how they got there, and how they got to her. Um, Unfortunately, some of that information has been lost, but uh, I know the archaeology collections have been working on piecing together those provenances as much as they can and incorporating local communities uh, and stakeholders to work with these, with these objects. And things go out more yeah. on that question. Yeah, so that particular <coughs> collection, some people would be surprised that we have an old unknown collection here in California, and it's because of the specific uh, purchase that she made, which is a relatively large one, a couple hundred uh, pieces, 300 pieces or so maybe. Um, the materials are from mound sites, which some of which are burial sites, some of which are not. So uh, we're lacking detailed provenance on that. Materials that we do have, uh, that we believe do have a provenance of burial costs, provenance including from this collection, have been reported as part of uh, federally mandated and also ethically mandated reporting So the, the information about them has been put out in the Federal Registrar and Registrar. Uh, so that particular collection we haven't consulted with any tribes yet. We have definitely with more local tribes and uh, both nationally and internationally for other pieces of the collection. So I expect some 
So if you go back to your original statements about being on the tours that people lead through the campus and the student tours, if you go back to that, what would you inform them about Leland Stanford Jr.'s legacy and what it really should be to be accurate? How would you describe that based on your research? I, oh, that's a great question. Let me, let me ponder that. I think uh, it's interesting that this, the history only gets mentioned maybe 15 minutes into the tour, uh, and it goes they start to say it right in front of the Hoover Tower, and they kind of muddle this history into other facts, like it was Stanford was free for all students up until a certain time, and we're one of the biggest universities on campus. I think it's really important to say this history first, um, and to kind of emphasize that this university, yes, was based in memoriam on a, stu a student, you know, a growing student. I think that really gives Stanford a unique uh, foundational history that other American universities don't have because they're not created in memoriam necessarily on, on one singular person. Um, and I think it's important again to emphasize that you know Stanford really was, Leland Jr. really was you know active in, in collecting items and uh, he did have a unique childhood and it makes Stanford a unique place. <laughs>